Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let Me Talk. Today is Monday, November 20th, and I am coming to you still from New York City. I'm here all month long, rocking and rolling, doing stand-up comedy every night, and uh, living the dream, living the dream. My voice is totally fried right now. Picked up some kind of fucking chest cold, probably on the F train. Thank you, F Train, for this uh, insane chest throat thing going right now, which is hilarious because I've got to do comedy at night, and I'm just up there like, you know what I mean? <coughs> you know what I mean? It's <laughs> You only need two things, man. You need to be alive and your voice when you're doing stand-up, and uh, I only got one of them right now. <coughs> man. Anyway. Let's get into it. Today is an incredible episode. I get lucky sometimes, man. The planets align and boom, something good happens. Uh, I'm here in New York and I happen to be here exactly the same time as Magpie Salute, which, uh, of course, if you're a fan of this show, you know who the hell Magpie Salute is. It's uh, a lot of the Black Crows members, uh, including my favorite. Uh, Rich Robinson, Mark Ford, those two together, my favorite guitar combo, just insane. Uh, today's episode, I got Mark, I got Sven, I got John, and I got Rich. It's four, four different interviews all in one show. I have never done that, and uh, I like it. I like it a lot. It was a great, great couple of days hanging out with uh, Magpie, which is funny because people always ask me, do you miss playing rock and roll? And uh, I don't. I don't at all. But then when you're in some kind of zen zen uh, situation, like hanging with Magpie, I was like, oh, yeah, I would miss rock and roll if this was my band, 100%. I mean, I, I, I can't even tell you how fucking good these guys were to me in the 48-hour period that we hung out, had dinner, shared stories, watched sound checks, uh, got, to, got to check out the uh, inner belly of Magpie Salute. And just, it's so fun to uh, become friends with Rich over the, over the last year or so because oh, all those years I just thought he was mean. And, and, you know, like, oh, oh, man, Rich, he's mean. And then little did I know, he's the nicest guy on the planet. And, of course, Mark Ford, an old, old friend of mine. Just, I, I can't say enough, man, of how much fun I had watching this band two nights straight. And just going, that's, that's, that's what it's about. I point at it and I just think in my mind, that's what it's fucking about. Playing tons of different songs with friends and and just enjoying the art of rock and roll. And at the end of the day, that is all that matters. It doesn't matter about who said what, he said this, that, this, and that. And... Uh, I firmly believe you're only here one time and you, you got you to gotta make it work, you know? So I never choose sides. I don't go to chat boards and... Be, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I don't do any of that shit because I know how hard rock and roll is and I know that um, to do it, and still do it in your 50s, in your 60s, and seven years old. Uh, to keep playing it all your life, you have to go through battles, ups and downs, and uh, insanity. So, as far as what's going on with Chris and Rich, that's between them, and it always will be. And for now, I enjoy both both the things. It's just like when Ozzy left Sabbath, I had Blizzard of Oz and I had Dio era. You know, there's no sides, but I'll tell you what, these guys are fucking gold. 
And we need great rock and roll right now. And these songs are too good not to be played. And, you know, that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm going to keep going here with the intro and get into uh, what else? Oh, I got great shows coming up. December 1 and 2. Yes. Albuquerque, New Mexico, Route 66 Casino Hotel. I will be with Bill Burr. December 2nd, Desert Diamond Casino, Arizona. I will be with Bill Burr. Wow, that's going to be fucking great. And then uh, December 7, 8, 9, Sacramento, Joey Diaz and I coming to the punchline. What a great December. Oh, man. Uh, what else do I got going? I want to give a shout out to the donators. The donators. Del Razors. Donators. Uh, thank you, Henry Garma. Awesome. Uh, Henry Garma donated to, uh, D, uh, what is it? Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Man, my voice is trashed. Uh, you guys might get lucky. You might get a short intro today because my voice is trashed. You're like, thank God, get to the episode. <laughs> Episodes brought to you by Earthquaker Devices, my fantastic guitar stomp pedal sponsor. I know a lot of guitar players are going to be tuning into this, and you want to know what a great stomp box is. Get one made in America in Akron, Ohio. Earthquaker Devices. All kinds of sounds. You know you want to be cool. You know you want to be rocking. Go to Earthquaker Devices. Look at all the giant stars. They're playing Earthquaker Devices. That's because they're bulletproof and they sound amazing. EarthquakerDevices.com or Instagram. Follow them immediately and check out all their cool... Um, they're doing all kinds of cool things on Instagram. Also, Carson Hess... My incredible guitar sponsor, you know, and uh, you've heard me talking about Carson, the incredible boutique guitar builder. Check him on Instagram, Carson Hess 81. You want your guitar to be, uh, maybe you got an old Fender and you need to get it uh, a vintage restoration, or you just want a, a new guitar built, go to... Carson S81 on Instagram or his website, HESSPD.com. This guy is killing it, killing it in the guitar world. I love it. I love this sponsor. Such great sponsors. And of course, my boys, Elko and Harley. Elko and Harley running all kinds of great deals this week for Thanksgiving. Black Friday coming up. Black Friday! Uh, check out Elko and Harley. They got that brand new uh, Harley in there. What is that thing called? I can't even remember. I'm so out of it right now. The Sport Glide. That's what it is. Oh, man, I love this new bike. The Sport Glide 2018. It's half bagger, half Dyna, half soft tail. The hybrid super machine. I'm loving it. Go check that and all their other bikes out and get yourself a motorcycle for Thanksgiving, Christmas. You know what I mean? Treat yourself. Go, hey, I need a motorcycle. I'm tired of what people are saying. No, I can't get one. I'm going to get one. And I'm going to El Cajon Harley. Give them a call. 619-444-1123. Tell them Del Rey sent you. Del Razors. Uh, all right. Anyway. What do we got going here? We got the great episode. We got some shows coming up. Thank you for all your donations. Now, one last thing. Let's get into a little sad news. I could talk for hours about this man, but, you know, you guys all know how I feel about ACDC. The all-time greatest the all-time greatest riff writer, rhythm player, outlaw rock and roller passed away on Saturday, Malcolm Young. And, uh, you know, it's so funny because 
when you wake up in the morning and you have 50 text messages, you know something's wrong. You don't even need to read all 50. You just read the first one. And then it just socks you in the fucking gut. It's never, it's never good news. It's never, hey, we won the lottery and we want to give it all to you. It's never that. That's what happened Saturday morning. Woke up. There it was. Malcolm Young gone. And, you know, I mean, dementia is just... Wow, it's so scary, and and just to think that guy, you know, sixty four years old, gone. But I will do. I will say one thing, and I'll celebrate this. The guy won. He won, man. He'd been playing in ACDC since nineteen seventy three. He wrote, arguably. Some of the greatest rock riffs of all time. He had his own style, his own flavor, that incredible Gretsch guitar. Later on, my, my, my favorite era, that Back of Black with the White Falcon. Um, just looking like a badass. Jeans, sneakers, a denim jacket, straight hair parted down the middle. Just walking up to that mic, singing, you know, backgrounds, the tone, everything about that guy. A lot of people don't even know who Malcolm Young is. It's unbelievable. It is really unbelievable to me. And also, I do believe that's probably how he liked it. To be in the biggest band in the world, but be able to go down to the grocery store or something. The freedom of that. I can't tell you how bummed I am, and I, I obviously, but I can tell you this. I will be playing ACDC probably every day for the rest of my life, like I've been doing my entire life up to now. I love this band, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just a bummer. So long live my man, Malcolm Young. I love you, brother. And uh, there will never be another Malcolm Young. All right, guys, let's get into the episode. Here it is, Magpie Salute. Another episode of Left to Be Talk. This this is great, man. Uh, Rich Robinson here. I'm actually going to interview a few guys in the band, but it's hilarious to think about. Here we are in New York City. I interviewed you like a year ago. Yeah. And Mark and uh, and it was like I I felt like you knew this was going to happen, <laughs> but, but you didn't tell me. No. Did you no know? No idea. No idea at all. How did it happen? Because I interview you. You got the solo record come out. I see in New York, and you know, back then you're doing the record, uh, the tour for the record, and then uh, boom, this thing happens. Well, it was more like uh, as I was booking my tour, you know, I this show came up to do in Woodstock, and it was something that I had done a couple of years previous, and I was like, yeah, I'll do it again, but I, I really want to try something different, and. As I get older and as I play more, and I, I realize what a gift it is, and I started really feeling so grateful for being having these musicians in my life that you know people like Mark and Ed and and you know even my brother to an extent and and Joe Magistro and Sven and these people that I've grown that just I have this regardless of personalities just like musically we all click so well yeah it's chemistry it's just chemistry impossible and to find a lot of times and then impossible. to find it twice is really absurd exactly you know exactly so 
you know, I was like, well, let's invite Mark and just see if he's into it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so I Were you leery him. about that at first? No. I was like, yeah, well, let's see. Let's just, you know, I was more like, let's just see if he's interested. Yeah. And we'll go from there. And uh, so we reached out to him and he and his manager's like, he's he's there. Yeah. Whatever it is. <laughs> he doesn't care. He just wants to come. That's great. And so I'm like, fuck, that's amazing. So we started talking got on the phone i explained what i was thought would be cool you know and then i took it you know i was like well fuck it i'm gonna call ed yeah yeah <laughs> you know because i speak to ed semi-regularly a couple of times a year i would have sp i spoke to him you know just email see, or phone i'd call him yeah just to see if he was cool and check on him and you know and i was like you want to do this he's like man i'm there you know so he got <laughs> his got his passport he was all set and he came down and, and it was you know it was just one of those things man ed came in and just the first chord he played was amazing you yeah know, it was just like that's ed and ed came in a day before mark did and then the next day mark flew in i watched some of that footage man yeah. and it uh look i kind of got goosebumps right <laughs> now because it was it just felt so so much heart there man yeah, yeah, these yeah. guys are strolling on that compound there yeah. and and it's just kind of like Whatever happened in the past, who gives a fuck? It's immediately gone. Yeah. And man, this is great. We're up in the wood, Woodstock. Yeah. We're going to play just music. Plan. Yeah, that's it. Just yeah. playing music together. And so that's what it was. And the funny thing is Mark's flight was delayed. We were going to have a rehearsal day a little bit, like, you know, but he didn't do it. He showed up halfway through the set because his, you know, his flight was delayed. His car was delayed. It was all these things. And he just walked in and it was, and it was just came in it was fucking great and wow that's just how it is you know and wh what what did you uh think of playing at the time was it just like whatever let's just break I, out you know i was like well we'll do some crow songs and do some covers and we'll do some stuff you know just see where it goes and then when mark was there i'm like hey you want to play on this He's like yeah i'll do it you know yeah so it was just really like everything that we do is just really loose but it's just more about our abilities and our musicianship to be able to just get up and play and just play something cool. And that's how it always was right. in a sense, you know, now after you do this, how does it, uh, the tour come about after you, you go, this feels pretty good. Let's do this. Well, I was, after I left, I mean, Ed was, you know, was like, look, man, we got to do this. You know, that's what he said when I was leaving. And, and I felt the same way. And, and I think everyone did, you know, I think everyone in the audience. Did, yeah. I think, and, He's like, this can't be it. You know, that's what Ed said. And so I was like, okay. And, and I finished on my tour for the solo record. And we were in Texas. And I was just like, how will this work? Like, how, what would this yeah. look like? What, yeah. You know, just trying to find, put it, piece it together. You know, what would Because you got a 10 piece band. Yeah. And, 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 well, that was before John, too. Right. But when you look at it, you know, seven, eight, nine, yeah. ten piece band. Yeah. Right away, uh, since I've been in the biz all my life, I go, well, there's no money there. Yeah, so yeah. you're strictly doing this for uh, the love, which is very cool, you yeah. know? And that's got to be pretty crazy in this yeah. time, you know? It is. it is. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty, it's, a, it, it's tough, but it's also everyone's here for the right reasons right you know so that that you can kind of guarantee that and but so we were like going i'm like oh man you know what i liked about it was the inclusion so let's include these guys into my i was happy with my solo band but i'm like oh wow mark and ed are playing with you know my my guys you know that i loved and right thought were cool and and they just brought so much to it and then i thought wow how cool is it for ed to play with our keyboard player and you know and mark to play with nico and me and all this stuff and then as i was piecing it together i'm like well you know mark and i'll sing and let's maybe try this or i don't know i was thinking about this and then i was like fuck it and it just hit me john john's like the best guy for yeah now you never thought of another singer that's one question i had because i remember at the time gorman sent me over a dude that was straight up your brother yeah, i mean yeah. it was crazy that australian guy yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. i couldn't believe it because he sent it to me he goes what do you think and I got to respect the fact that you didn't go with something like that, even right like uh, today, Stone Temple Pilots announced a dude. And a lot of bands get guys that sound exact because, you know, the crowd needs that or whatever. But this has got a, a, a great flavor. There's some, there's some hints of Chris there, but there's definitely uh, John's own thing. Did you think about a different singer at all? No. I mean, John and I, well, you know, I was at first like maybe we get a female singer to sing with me and mark Some, I mean, someone know, like, who could sing almost like more like a bonnie 
you know delaney of delaney gotcha one. but then i was like well man john is just the he's just my friend and he's so cool and he and that's going to be the guy and what john's doing is he's he's you know people go you know they come into this and he's going to serve the song first so he's going to sing the melody of course but john is john and he's going to sing like him right and that's the way it is and it's amazing that way you know yeah. what he's bringing to it is is amazing and and just you know he's got these shoes to fill man but he just does it he's got such a great attitude and he has nothing but respect and reverence for what chris did and and that that shows i mean that's the thing about this band is it's there's no there's nothing snarky or bullshit about it we're just up there because we want to be we want to play this music you know yeah well yeah i mean when you look at this body of work and even if we got into the hot hot subject of uh, Chris on Howard Stern or yeah. whatever, you know, the bottom line is when you get into this body of work, it can't not be played. That's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, Chris, he's also slipped into this delusional sort of space where he, he has talked him and his, and his family into this weird, uh, you know, into this weird thing he's tried to diminish my contribution and you know and so that's and that's unfortunate more for him because he just kind of wants to take everything you know wants to take everyone's money wants to take all the credit and and you know it's it's it wasn't just about him right you know not at all for a guy that didn't play guitar until in you know the late mid to late 2000s it's pretty funny and so you know but that's but that's him and that's unfortunate but you know to me like you said i mean you know, I wrote all the the music to this this band. You know, and and I love this music. I love what Mark brought to it. I love what Eddie brought to it. I love what Chris brought to it. I love these songs. I mean, they're they're a part of me. I wrote them. You know, I mean, you you have this int and in, you know really strong relationship with things that you create or that I you know the people that create these things they have this draw to them. Yeah, and it's important. And so to me. Chris doesn't want to do it. Well, fuck it. You know, I'm, uh, let's do this. You know, let's yeah. do it with friends and let's do it with the people that played on these records and 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 then let's bring in some new blood and see what they bring to the table and and you know then while we're at it let's play these amazing covers of people that we've toured with like Bob Dylan and and Jimmy Page and Neil Young and you know ACDC and you know whoever we're do you do an ACDC song? Yeah, we, we learned one. Oh, what one? Gone shooting. Oh, you gotta let me sing that, dude. I murder that. I murder that. I'm the human Bon Scott sampler. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got him tattooed on my side. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's worth it, man. Got so it. we just do everything because we're just having fun. That's what it's about. But we've been writing a bunch of stuff. The, this new record's coming out next year, and we're going to go into the studio early next year. Wow. Now, where are you going to do the record? I'm probably, I don't know, Nashville or upstate New York. Or... Uh, Omis Omission's an amazing tune, and it came smashing out, and uh, it sounds like a classic Black Crest song. Was it a tune you had around for a long time? I'd written it for Hookah Brown. Oh, gotcha. Me and John wrote it. But that was right before we kind of just didn't, we just kind of took a left turn and didn't really pan out. But it was one of those songs that first thing I was like, oh shit, we have this song, you know, yeah. let's just do it. You know, it was never released and no one really knew who Hookah Brown was. So let's just, oh, let's do this thing. You know, it was kind of cool. Yeah, it's and, great And we did have Mark play on it and Sven and everyone just came in and did it. And it was such a cool thing. Well, what's amazing about that song is if you listen to it, that is the bottom line of that is the the sound of the Black Crows or, or Magpie Salute now. But I mean, that's your sound. You know what I mean? When you hear it right away, you'd go, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is uh, so hard for guys to have their own sound. You yeah. know, it's great, man. Now, here's my question. How do you guys pick the, song, the set list? Do, do you kind of, because uh, I've seen you a few times on this run, do you, do you linger around a record for each night? Like, okay, kind of a three snakes tonight? or It kind of works out to be that way sometimes. It feels like that. Yeah, but it's yeah. not in, in anything in particular. Like, you know, we have, there's so much material to do from, um, to pull from, you know. I mean, and it's been really cool to 
pull some of these unreleased songs or old oh, crow oh, yeah. songs, deep songs. Like Exit. Yeah, yeah. Pain and Eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Miserable. Feathers. Yeah, Feathers. Uh, yeah. All title that, song. Oh, yeah, Title yeah. Song. All yeah. those are such great songs. That's what I love when you're at a show. You see the fans lose their mind. Yeah. They're not in there for She Talks to Angels. They go crazy on like Title Song. Yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. like, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, exactly. That is the shit. So to be able to pull from all that stuff and just you know really shape I, I mean i do the set list every night and just and just send it out and like look any suggestions anything anyone wants to you do it each just, night for the next day yeah I, uh mainly mainly day of right you know, like i'll just like today i didn't get to it till about three <laughs> and so. and how do you do do you have a stats i have i have uh just a list of all the i have a major list of all the songs just a master list wow how and many are on there like over 200 now for just black crows or all the covers no, and all everything the covers and and mark and i songs and wow and crow songs and so. you can see the stats how many times you play nope, them right no nope, you don't know that no. i got a set list.com like i just looked at exit oh really you guys have played it nine times on oh, this shit. run okay which is cool but you haven't played it since july yeah so that kind of shit is straight up like the dead you know where's fire on the mountain you yeah, know yeah, yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah, exactly. you know um, Someone had said it the other day. Nico was like, "We haven't played Exit in a while." I'm like, "Oh shit, I forgot." You know, yeah, because it's hard to keep track. You know, it's I, I don't do. I just pick them. You know, see what happens. You just pick them by vibe, or just like, oh yeah, I forgot about that one. Wow, <laughs> is there a song that you haven't played in the catalog? Uh, in the catalog, Black Crows wise, there's a couple of them. Right. My, the the ones that I stay away from are the ones Chris wrote, which are there's about five of them, and those were in, on the later records. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like Roll Old Jeremiah and the disco song and all that horseshit. Yeah. I just don't. <laughs> it's just not my songs. I don't like them. I don't really want to play them. Right. But everything else is on the table. Man, that's it's so great. It's it's so great to see you here in New York. This is where it started. Yeah. It's that's what's cool about it. That's why we were like, wow, let's end here. You know. Now. You're going to do a record, all, all um, originals? New originals, yeah. And how many originals do you have now, or are you going to go write them? I have, there's about six that we've kind of messed around with at Soundcheck that are relatively finished, and I have about 35 other things. And Mark's got things, and John's got things, so we're just going to get together and just finish, put them all together and see what happens. Wow, that's so cool, yeah. man. Now I had I asked some uh, questions online of some uh, some fans might want to ask so I, I remember this one and I watched I watched you uh, you were kind of playing the B bender telly pretty uh, pretty much during sound check. What is your if you could only go out? I know it's impossible for you, but one guitar on the run. Let's say they go, dude, you can only go out with one guitar. What would it be? I probably have to be my gold top. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, just because it's versatile. I mean, it can do whatever, you know? Yeah. I mean, I can get a clean sound. It doesn't distort, you know, like feedback. I mean, you know, I, I would choose the White Falcon, but it's yeah. it's a little more temperamental. Yeah, that thing that thing could fall apart on you. Yeah. Right? It's, it's That one's a great one, but it's they could. Yeah, some of them can be a little fragile, yeah. No. Mark was telling me you guys were at, at the beginning of the tour. The idea was to go some tweed amps to keep the stage volume low, which is completely the opposite of the old days. Yeah. But he said that it wasn't working once you got into pedals and stuff. Uh, you got that reason down there, and then you got the Vox hand wired, uh, which sound amazing. But it goes to, uh, goes down to that thing again. Like no matter what you play out of it, just sounds like you. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, I was. I look at the amps. I go, no, it just sounds like back in the day when you were in the Jubilees. Yeah, yeah. Or the Matchless, you right. know, and all that. Yeah, I mean it, that's where it comes from. You know, some. I was Mark and I did that Guitar World thing the other day, and this guy was like, "Can you give me some? You know, we want to sound like you know you guys as much as possible." And I'm like, "Look, man. I mean, you know, just." I, I've played Jimmy Page's rig. I played Keith Richards' guitar and rig, and it yeah. doesn't. It sounds like me. Yeah. And when they play it, it sounds like them. It's really more about what you bring to the table. You know, yeah. there's just nothing like it. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to tell you, man, your singing has really gotten great oh, over cool. the years. Uh, I just watched Soundcheck. Uh, I don't know if it's more confidence now, or you've just been doing it so much, but uh, it's just it's just great. 
When I started, I never wanted to sing. It wasn't interesting to me. And Chris would just be like, sing the high part, and that would be yeah. it, you know? Yeah. So when you're singing back up, and you're just like struggling to sing the fucking the high part. You know yeah, what I mean? yeah. Just like way the fuck up there. Way out of your range. Chris would sing really high too. Yeah. And then I would sing even higher. Sven takes those now. He's yeah. like, oh. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. <laughs> he bravely takes that shit. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, singing backup is, has nothing to do with singing lead. It's Not at so all. two different things. And so ultimately, you just got to do it. And in the same way that John Hogg is, you know, John's a musician that plays guitar and bass and drums and he can play everything. Right. And so for him to stand on stage naked and just sing. Oh, yeah. In front of a, a lot of people. Yeah. Normally kids do that at age 18, 19, 20, where no one's paying attention and no one gives a shit. Yeah, you and figure you can out hone your moves. Your skills. Yeah, you, figure you figure out your it moves. Out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But doing it at my age, coming from, or even when I started, you know, in my, in my early 30s, it wasn't my first thing, so I had to learn how to do it. And I was singing wrong all those years in The Crows. I mean, oh, I yeah. just didn't know how to, I'd, you know, you just, just doing you don't it. know how to do it. So then you, by doing it, you learn a lot, you know, hey, oh, this doesn't work, this works, I can do this, I can't do that. And then that's just where it comes from. Yeah. So, yeah. You do uh, you warm up and stuff? No, Did you take uh, some lessons? Mm -mm. I nope. took some lessons. I took some lessons a long time ago, but more repair. Like how do you repair your voice right. after you fuck it up? <laughs> yeah. So that's that's just the way it is. <laughs> now how do you guys travel? One tour bus? Two buses. Two buses. Well, we have sixteen people. So So we you got can't. ten in the band yep. and six crew. Yeah. My God. Yeah. Well, I mean, because we have two guys on stage. We have a monitor guy, a production guy monitor slash production and a front of house slash tour manager and then an assistant tour manager because you know getting around in that scenario is tough i mean yeah. you know trying to get a sound man to the you know took a lot it takes a lot of time to mix a 10-piece band and to have it seem balanced and yeah. work out and so you know there's great sound local sound guys but changing a sound guy every night changing all that stuff. that's not good yeah when you're when you're going over the covers do you, I watched you guys just go over some covers today and stuff. You got to do that every day, right? Just kind of refresh some uh, and the lyrics. Uh, you know, everything is just like, how's that go? That, so the sound check is actually a rehearsal every yeah, day. Yeah. Actually, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, sound. I mean, we, we're rehearsing sound. We're getting all levels for everyone and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's rad, man. It's I, <laughs> I, I, I got to hear. I remember when you guys did ACBC, right? BCDC. Yeah, BCDC, man. I got to hear you guys do, do a Shot Down in Flames. What made you choose that one? Uh, Such a great song. I don't know. I mean, we did Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be, Shot Down in Flames. Yeah. And then, what else? Sin City, I think. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Remember. yeah. I mean, we grew up loving ACDC. Oh, right. And the first stadiums we played was opening for acdc on monsters of rock tour wow in europe and it was like a whole all summer six weeks just us with, with some heavy metal bands in the middle that we didn't really care about but yeah it was us and, it, and we watched acdc every night and it was amazing <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. those guys are like a machine oh, man yeah I mean, they're an absolute industry. There's a crazy book out right now. Did you hear about that? About what? That guy that uh, that guy Fink. He wrote a book where basically he really dug deep and uh, into you know Bon Scott basically writing the Back in Black album. Really? Yeah, it's just out right now. Uh, wow. I'm I'm just starting it up, but when you. Uh, when he went deep, he found old friends of Bond. Oh, shit. He found ex-girlfriends of Bond, all that stuff, man. So you got to get into that and check oh, that man, out. That's cool. Have you checked out uh, Fraternity and... Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. I remember, my buddy got me a video of that for my birthday oh, when wow. I was a kid. He's like, I checked it. I put it on. I thought it was a joke. Yeah. I was like, why'd you give me this? And uh, he's like, watch it for a while. And then, you know, it's Bond with a beard. Yeah, yeah, and he's yeah. like, can you... Yeah, yeah, man. There's a guy playing like flute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're on the. Oh my god. He did shape I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Which right. Was cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh my good. god. And then he was in the Valentines. Yep, the Valentines. It's which so was wild. A, like a bubblegum pop band or something. Yeah. Right. Right. Which is really wild. You know. Yeah. Um, 
I fa- I, somebody just sent me some wild photos of Bond. I'll show you after the uh, interview. Just old photos never seen before. You oh, know? that's cool. That guy was an outlaw, he right? He was amazing, man. I mean, he really was. He was that guy was unbelievable. You know, that's a, that's an interesting thing too because that's a dynamic on your band where your singer uh, isn't dead. You know what I mean? And so there's always people going, what if they're going to get back together? What if, you know what I mean? Which is really crazy, you know? Yeah. I never understood where people just don't go like, well, this is fucking great, you know? And we got this over here, too, if we want to watch yeah, either yeah. one, you know? You know, look, people get, they get contextual about you and they like you in a context that they're used to. Yeah. And if it's, especially if it's something that's really successful, yeah. they want to keep seeing you in that context. Because it obviously generated a feel or a feeling for them right you know so ultimately it was like these people love this music and it brought them you know helped them in a bad time and helped this and helped that and or they loved it they had fun it reminded them of a girl it reminded them of high school whatever the fuck it was yeah at the end of the day they like that and they keep coming back because of that connection that they use that music for and so you know i can understand why they want it but this is a different thing. And, you know, the people that are giving it a chance really love it. And more yeah. and more people are coming out. And, you know, and we did really well in, in you know, in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, uh, you know, Atlanta, up in New Hampshire, throughout the Northeast. We were always, you know, doing really well. So it's cool, you know, to see. And it's you can see people come out with their arms crossed like, you know, I don't know what this. And then at... <laughs> By the end, they're rocking out. Yeah. That's a cool thing. I I think, um, like when I saw it at the Fonda, I was pretty blown away by how tight the band sounds. Yeah. Because there were eras of the Black Crows where it was kind of scraggly. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You're going like, well, what's going on here? Yeah. But this band, I think he opened with um, Sting Me, maybe at that one, or My Morning Song, I think. But it was... It was like wow. It was like a. It was muscle. Yeah, man. It sounded smoking right away, right yeah. out of the gate. And I was like, Joe oh, I'm in. Finn, you know. Yeah, that's that's really Joe. Just I mean, locked. Yeah, exactly. What a great drummer. It was man. cool. He's amazing, and he, you know, just the way that the two of us play together is like is the is really what it is, you know. Now, who's the keyboard player? Nick Rosen. And, so. and, and, of course, you lost Ed right after. Yeah, and we had Matt Slocum, but Matt Slocum had committed to John McLaughlin and Jimmy Herring tour this year. So we had a couple of temporary guys until Nick Rosen came in. So. And where'd you find him? Colonel Bruce Hampton. Oh, wow. Yeah. I talked to the colonel before he passed away, and I was like, look, you know, do you know anyone? And he was like, man, Nick Rosen, he's the guy, you know. So Yeah. He's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Now, where well, you got two more dates on this? Uh, three, if you include tonight. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Three more. And yep. then uh, off to do a record. Yeah. Did you move to L.A. yet? No. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to stay in, in Nashville. No shit. Yeah, we decided to stay. So What made you change your mind? Uh, the peacefulness. Oh, I was going to tell you, man. Nashville, because L.A. is fucking crazy. The traffic, the traffic is, is insane. It's exploding, it feels like. It's Today, just... they said it was the number one most congested city in the world. Yeah, really? In the world. They, they, they just did a report. Are you out of your fucking mind, right? Like, I come to New York nonstop to do comedy now, and I absolutely love it because I just get on the subway. Yeah. I'm, I feel like I, I, I'm underground. I pop up. It's like a submarine, and yeah. then I'm where I need to be. Yeah. And, and, exactly. and no fucking around, man. Well, it, I mean, you know, we were out there, and it was just like everywhere we went it's just traffic all 20 it seems like 24 7 absolutely that's that's the problem there's no easy time now yeah. maybe between 3 30 a.m and 4 yeah, 30 yeah. you got a exactly. you got a, you got a, a window there and where we were living in topanga before we moved um you know the now the 405 is so constantly you know crowded people come over like malibu canyon and they come over topanga canyon yeah and, it, and at like 7 30 it's filled up from the bottom all the way up to Topanga Village. It's yeah. like crazy. Ways fucked up everyone. Yeah. Ways. Because you could live on this quiet street and yeah. never see anyone. All of a sudden you're like, what's up with all these cars yeah. every fucking day? It's ways. ways. Yeah. Fuck you, Ways. <laughs> I, I live, you've been to my house. Yep. I live uh, nine miles from LAX. Last week I was flying to Iowa and um, at 5.30 in the morning, it took me an hour and a half to go nine miles. Really? 
Five thirty in the morning. Jesus, fuck that! It's unbelievable. I played the surf ballroom with Bill Burr. Have you ever oh, done that? No. That's the last spot Buddy Holly, Big Bopper, and Richie Valens played in Idaho. In Iowa. Iowa. Oh no, no, yeah. no! I don't think we ever played. You got to play that. That's cool. I think you dig it, man. Yeah, yeah. Mark's played there. I saw a signature in the oh, really? uh, thing. Yeah, Mark Ford band. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, it's big, man. It holds like two thousand, but oh, it sure. rocks. All right, maybe we did. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, you want to talk to John now? Yeah. Hey, John. Yeah. Oh, wait, hey, real quick, your son's here. He plays music, right? Yeah, he's uh, he loves uh, the Velvet Underground. That's rad. Yep. He's, Does he play uh, guitar? He plays guitar. He's good. And sings? He's, he sings. He sings. He's he's good rhythm player. You got to have him open up. Yeah, maybe. I'm it trying to I'm trying to convince him to find another line of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, dude. Well, here's Thank John Hawk. So much. Yeah. How are you, buddy? How you doing? Man, it, uh, it's, good, it's good to talk to you, dude. Yeah. I was just talking to uh, Rich. I think, you know, of course, the, the elephant in the room is the big shoes. You know what yeah, I mean? I know. Big shoes. Yeah. yeah, I've had to live with that elephant for a while. Yeah. Mm. Now, uh, I don't really know the history of you except for that, of course, Hookah Brown. <laughs> but uh, where'd you grow up? London? Grew up in London, yeah. 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 yeah so. and, and you were playing music there for years? Yeah, I was doing bands at school and all that kind of thing, you know. And I guess, you know, I heard, I first, heard, oh, thank you. Yeah. I first heard um, uh, The Black Crows when I was about 17. My friend's sister, she's came and told my mate to turn that Iron Maiden crap off and put this on, you know. <laughs> oh, were you a Maiden guy? Well, no, I was. I, I, I was into, I was learning bass at the time, so, I, you know, I was just into learning whatever, you know, but I was into things like the Beatles and Hendrix. And, yeah. You know, the, what was like old music. So as the 80s come around, it was kind of a sort of lost time a little bit for somebody my age, you know, because you're thinking, oh, there's no... You got that new wave of British heavy metal going on, like Saxon, yeah. Maiden. Yeah, uh, well, but the, but uh, uh, my the way I started, I didn't you know I didn't learn from that stuff. So the so, so what I I I started you know with the Who and all these kinds of things. So I just carried on in that way, picked up a bit of that stuff along the way, you know. But then the Black Crows appeared. You know, when I was about seventeen, I was listening to the Doors and whatever, and um and then. I did a band, I carried on doing music, did a band called Moak. It was the first band I did that got a kind of crappy little deal, you know, and we didn't really care. Spent out 300 yeah. quid. And then, you know, we were over in London. And somehow it got picked up by an American independent label. And so we ended up getting invited to tour with the Black Crows. Oh, wow. On the By Your Side tour. So that was how I kind of met them all, you know. And, so and you I guys was, were open for the Black Crows. Yeah. Which tour was that for the Crows? It was By Your Side. It was like 1999 oh, by your side, yeah. or something like that. And we did like the, e, you know, six weeks down the East Coast, you know. Wow. Like Beacon Theatre and all this stuff. We would have never had done anything like that before, you know. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ended up, you know, meeting Chris and Rich. And Rich was the one who kind of, I guess he, 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 you know, he made the decision to try this band out. Yeah. And um, but you know, we met him and he would hang out on the bus and ended up on the crew bus. And, oh, so yeah, that was how I met him in the first place. Um, and that's wow. how I first met Chris as well. Wow, that's wild, man. So, so then, you know, we got through a couple of albums and had a great time. You know, driving ourselves around with a credit card and just, yeah, you know doing what you do when you're young and uh and then when that finished it just coincided with rich and chris were taking a break for the first time right and so he called and was like do you want to come and do something he'd been writing some new songs you know like so we did about 18 months or a year or something of playing together and writing some stuff together which was an amazing experience it didn't i was I, probably a bit young bit inexperienced had some people around me that didn't really help the situation. Some work. enablers. Yeah, you know, like you, you, yeah. people, I learned lots of them, but it, it didn't help that situation. Right. And then, so we just kind of kept in touch over the years. You know, I'd always go and watch The Crows in London or sometimes Rich, eventually he asked me to come up and sing a song, you know, like just to hang out. And then this turn, like this was, I guess, last November. Yeah. He'd been telling me, oh man, I've got this thing together with Eddie and Mark's come over and we, we, we might do some gigs and do you want to come and join him? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it, it seemed quite unplanned, you know? Over all those years in between of writing mm -hmm. stuff with uh, Hookah Brown and stuff, 
till joining last November. What were you doing? Were you playing music or were playing you working music. a day job? Or? I think got family, playing music, playing for, you know, doing quite a lot of, of the mate of mine who was in the band, right, Sean, right. he ended up doing engineering and production. So I was doing a lot of going up to his studio and playing bass on this or drums on that or singing on this and you know, kind of doing some of my own gigs when I felt like it. But, you know, and having a family and kind of, Make, right. juggling all of that and making it work and you know sticking to music but finding ways that would actually allow me to do that you know yeah what a great call to get right yeah it's great <laughs> but now, you know it meant suddenly doing this thing w with the absence of this other person you know right that was gonna it was gonna be a big uh issue for a lot of people you know yeah, it is. I was just talking to Rich about that because when you think about when it's a band and the singer has passed away, let's say, mm -hmm. people eventually go, okay, this is it. But when the singer's still alive... Absolutely. And, and everybody would rather that that singer was still doing something with that other right. singer and guitarist and because of what they loved, you know, yeah, what yeah. got them into it in the first place. It's, it, it, it's, a, it, it's an interesting thing for you because it's a win-win because, you know... Either people are going to like you yeah. and you're working or they're not. And it's like, who cares? I'm here, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I didn't really come with any reputation or anything other than Rich saying, look, I've got this mate in London that I think should come over, you know? Right. <laughs> so everyone was like, well, I guess if Rich says it's all right, it must be all right. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, once you get the call and you start figuring out you guys are going to do a, b a bunch of Black Crow songs. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a very interesting way that Chris sings the Absolutely, songs live yeah. compared to when he sings them yep. on record. Mm. Were you studying live stuff or uh, the records? It was well, I'd, you know, because we'd been on the tour. I kind of, even though we were much younger, we were just having a good time. But I had experienced that, yeah, and enjoyed it, and then see how what Rich does, and see how him and Chris used to sing together. So really, the thing with, for me, once I was aware of what I was getting involved in right i just said to rich look i just want it to be great so right. I, I just need your help i just need you to tell me about you know like up there what's going on with these songs and you know and he would i'd would sit in the car he'd say look why don't we pick 10 songs i'll send over 10 songs and we'll, we'll go through them and you do your bit call me when you you know when you kind of got your head around them and then we'll you know, I got my phone there, playing it in the CD at one in the morning so that the time zones match. And right. he would sort of talk through the singing. Because cause Rich sings like Chris. They sort of, they kind of, they got a different sound to their voice, but they sort of sing the same. Right. So when they do harmonies, it sounds... Yeah, like I could never tell who was doing what on yeah, Wiser Time. Got, exactly. Yeah, it's like, no time left now to change. Yeah, You're like, which guy is that? sound the same, yeah. yeah and they got yeah. a few songs like that. And it yeah. sounds like, I need to know, I need you to tell me what that is. Yeah. At, because that's just a personal, natural it's a thing. a lot like Alice in Chains between Lane and uh, exactly. Jerry. Exactly. Never could really tell. Yeah, it's just this double thing. Or, you know, Paul McCartney and John Lennon or whatever. Yeah. You know, they sometimes couldn't tell who's who you know because they're so familiar with each other growing up and everything you know so yeah. that was say so he was cool so he helped me with a lot of that kind of stuff and you know he'd say like thing is with this one you know chris was really pissed off with some yeah. birds you know like and yeah yeah like you, you know, that's the feeling you know yeah yeah I <laughs> and mean, it helps because yeah. it, it's some personal thing to them and it's like ah oh, because otherwise you know because you don't it's hard to identify those sort of things especially with somebody who's as unique and character of all as Chris. Yeah. As, as great as him, you know. Well, there was also those, there's key things that Chris does, mm -hmm. like in My Mar Morning Song, where yeah. it gets into that thing and he's like, I want you, yeah. I need you, yeah. I want you, you know, when it's getting exactly. into that. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah. you have to really watch some of the live stuff to know, because that's yeah. not all. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. And I would go to, actually, to answer your question, probably I would definitely flick between the versions. Like, I'd learn the song, like, you know, listen to the record like you're just enjoying the record and then watch them playing it and see how much he changes it and see like maybe I, I quite like that bit though so I might just stick to that bit yeah. there and maybe I'll do something you know and also ultimately I can only be me anyway exactly you know so yeah. but then once you know that you can try as hard as you want to do the same thing because it will never be the same anyway and so sometimes trying to learn all these phrases or whatever is good and other times it's it's more just feeling the song 
is the, was the important way in. Yeah, yeah, that is true because yeah. it's even when all the guys that replaced Mark Ford, yeah. they were incredible guitar players. Oh, yeah. But as you watch the live footage, I would always watch Wiser Time, and I'd yeah. be like, "Nope, the guy, you know, it's, it's a, just a it, thing. It's a thing, it's a man. Thing. It's slippery. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a soul. And it's, and it's, you know, with Mark and Rich, they're just connected somehow. Yeah, and that's just how it is. And so uh, that comes through in everything they do together it comes through in we do their songs next to each other it comes through when they play guitar together when they even talk together you know so yeah they've got quite the deep connection uh, absolutely you know? uh i'm going to talk to mark yeah. here but before i do i want to ask you one more question mm -hmm. when you were uh stepping into the shoes was the range in your vocal range already or is it uh is it like a so, something yeah. you had to really warm up and get ready for it's pretty i mean some of it is obviously young and i'm not definitely not that young anymore right but it's sort of in the same kind of right it's you know it's roughly yeah in, the, in that sort of range who were your who were your singers you dug growing up? I I mean I liked Steve Marriott and Bob Dylan and Killer, yeah. You know, obviously the Beatles. I would have yeah. loved Frankie that. Miller, you ever get into him? No, I didn't, no. Yeah, I check him out. Yeah, it, Frankie it, Miller, yeah. yeah. And Terry Reed I heard about before we started playing that stuff and I was into it and you know the early Robert Plant. Oh yeah. You know. And yeah. uh, and Jimi Hendrix is singing, you know, that kind of you know, Aretha Franklin is sort of cool. Yeah. Seeing as that kind of thing. So, Well, it's great to talk to you, yeah, man. Nice one, man. And you got an uh, Instagram, right? I want people to follow you. Yes, it is. I guess it's John Joseph Hogg 111. There you go. Yeah. John Joseph Hogg nice 111. One. Thank yeah. you, dude, cool. for good, sitting good, down good right you. on. Mark said he played at your birthday party. Yeah, Mark did. Yeah, Mark. <laughs> Mark Ford. I can't work out who the guitarist was you were talking about. Yeah. Oh, right. I think Mark Ford has been on the show the most. <laughs> I'm the most recurring star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and one and one of my favorite humans star, right. on the planet. Absolutely. Oh, man, I tell you what, you. I I did get a little nervous when a couple weeks ago you didn't play a gig. Somebody hit me and went, I went and saw Magpie right. and Mark didn't play, and yeah. I went, uh oh. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I did say, uh -oh. I know, everybody did, I'm sure. Yeah, I immediately texted Rich and said, what's going on with Mark? I guess you hurt your back or something? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I pulled a rib out. You like, pulled a rib out? How do you do that? Uh, apparently, what I've been told by all the chiropractors, and the way that I play is I pull, I'm constantly pulling down. Yeah. And so I'm just pulling on my... My uh, kick, my rib cage. Yeah, yeah. wow. And, then, and so I just haven't had enough muscle for how hard I'm trying to play, and I, I bent a rib out of place. That's I, it just woke me up in the middle of the night, like God, like oh my God, I couldn't move and. Ribs are crazy because I cracked my ribs on a motorcycle crash, and you have no it hurts idea. everywhere else. But oh, where, you know. <laughs> yeah, you have no idea yeah. that your whole fucking oh, body, your whole everything yeah. is off of your rib cage right. and your your chest plate. Absolutely. I couldn't even get out of bed. I know. I Breathing. couldn't. I couldn't wipe my ass. Yeah. I couldn't. <laughs> fuck, uh, for real, man. And well, it, there was no way I was going to stand on that stage. Wow. You know, so. I have to be careful, and but, well, because I mean, the, it's been an incredible year for me. Yeah, because prior Congrats. to the, the Vulture, I was horizontal mostly, you know, yeah. for a long time. I didn't really do much, you know, I physically. Yeah. You know? um, You're just laying around, you mean? Yeah, I didn't really, you know, and I had, and I hadn't realized how sick I'd gotten because I quit drinking. I lost a lot of weight from that. Yeah. And it just kept going. And so I, before I went to go sing for two hours a night for five weeks for the European tour. For your solo record. Right. I was like, mm, I don't think I got the energy for that. What's going on? So I went and saw the doctor and they're like, you got to cut out, you know, just a list of things. What did I, make you cut out? Wheat, soy, chocolate, milk, shellfish, wow. sesame. Um, I, I think that's, you know, a couple. Right. But, and just immediately cut that out. And that was just before I went to London for the four dates that we did. Right. That was just, and then I was starting my tour. Wow. And I was down to like, I was really skinny. I was. 
So you were so what you were sick, was, huh? My body had it. It just it it was so uh, it it had become so allergic to the foods that I had been eating all my life. Wow! It it, it wasn't taking the nutrients anymore, and it couldn't tell what was good and what was bad anymore. So it just stopped taking anything in. So I was eating my own muscle mass. Holy shit! To stay alive. Wow! But I didn't know it under all this beer fat. Wow! You're right? just cruising around. Right. So, uh, my rib cage started to collapse because there's no muscle to support my skeleton. Holy so shit! I can't breathe very well, right? Right. So, I immediately get on. You know, I get twisted around. You know, chiropractic things. You know, the diet changes immediately, and that's been difficult because if I eat incorrectly. Which is everything. Yeah, I know. I, I got you. Last and, time I saw and, you, I had diabetes, remember? And be, yeah, and to be traveling and try to get what I need to eat on plane flights. And it just, it's been an insane year, yeah. you know, on the mend. And so I'm eating all these supplements and protein, like, just yeah. to try to build the muscle up. I haven't built enough for how ro- hard I am rocking right now. A lot of, well, also. <laughs> so I've been a rib. It's true, though, man. Like, because yeah. when I'm in New York, I have to eat even more right. because I'm walking yeah. so much. So I was here all summer, and all of a sudden I was faded on yeah. stage and I was blurry. And yeah, I, didn't, I didn't know think. what was going on. And 200 yeah. songs uh, I can't grasp when yeah. I'm not eating. Yeah. And I can't eat things I can't eat. So if I can't find it when I need it, it's just, it's been a real difficult year. Yeah. Yeah. It is crazy. I carry these vegan protein bars around yeah. me, these, yeah. uh, these no cow bars. Yeah. And man, that saved me because you're on airplanes and shit right. and you start fucking getting hungry and mm-hmm. faded. You know, your blood sugar gets down or whatever. I eat well, one of these. Yeah, I would get to the point often where your vision starts going blurry. It means that you're getting into muscle mass for two. Wow. For calories. Holy shit. So how are you feeling now? Good. Good. But yeah. just tired, man. It's been yeah. a long, you know. So yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know how many gigs we did sixty-five or something, and I did five weeks and ahead of that. Jesus, like, like hundred gigs. gigs or something, almost. Yeah, I mean, on the mend, it's been. Yeah. And at fifty-one, it's a little different than I, was it twenty-five? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm yeah. fifty-one now. And yeah, I mean, everything is harder. Yeah, I laugh sometimes because uh, a couple of days ago, my body tells me. Just fucking go to bed, dude. It tells you. <laughs> right, yeah. And man, you'll sleep a 14-hour day, yeah. and you'll be like, oh, I was burning it yeah. at the both ends, yeah. man. And, yeah, yeah. and you know, a lot of that has to do with you and I as being artists our life. We don't work. We don't make money. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, right. it's a double-edged sword. Right. And, you it's, know? and it's always odd hours. and Odd hours. You know, I mean, and on it looks the run. crazy to everybody. Yeah, and yeah. it's cash, and it's you know maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know, it's like whatever. You know, it's what it pick costs to live a life outside of outside of the box. Yeah. And how's your hands? They're good. Yeah, they're, they're good. good. The only thing, you know, with all this like all this like muscle sort of trying to build, I get lactic acid a lot and it starts it's sore i feel like i'm working out all the time so oh I'm wow stiff all the time yeah i have to constantly stretch and i you know i'll cramp up but I, I got to take a bunch of magnesium because i'll cramp and my hand will just lock down no on shit neck, and i'll have to pull it off and like oh. i did it in the middle of the solo because we were joking about it and i and i like, you know, secret trade tricks. And I kind of turn my back. Yeah. And I'm looking at John while I do it. And he's seeing me doing it. And I, I pull my arm off. <laughs> and I bend it open behind my back just yeah. long enough to quick get it back as I turn my thing and finish the solo. <laughs> I stretched it out real quick. And he's like, damn, man. That's, the, that, you know, that's... Fucking wild, That's dude. time on the road, right? There. Yeah. That's pro shit. Yeah. This, I, I tell you, there's no easy <laughs> ride for Mark Ford. There has never been an easy ride for you. Know, you. I, if I've learned anything in these many years, 50 of them, 51, is that any, you know, fewer and fewer things I truly care about. And they're the hardest things in the world. Yeah. To keep. Yep. You know? So Absolutely. it just is getting fewer that I just got time for. Yeah. The rest of the shit, I don't, it don't matter. 
yeah, you yeah. have it now. <laughs> you know, especially your opinion of me. Yeah. It's really a bitchin' place to be. I wish I had it when I was younger. Yeah, you don't give a fuck anymore, right? right. You just want to play music and enjoy life, right? You don't know how long you're going to be here. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to do this till the wheels fall off, yeah. man. Yeah, and I get, you know, I get a vantage point to see what my decisions and my choices <clears throat> caused me. Yep. And it's better to do the better thing than not. It always is. Yeah, it's yeah. A smoother ride. Yeah, it is a smoother ride. You might have to learn patience, but... It is a virtue. I watched the sound check. Sounded great. Uh, bitch and band. Yeah. Oh, great band, right? Yeah, yeah. Great band. And it's it's great. It's it's really cool to see a band like this because, you know, it's old school. It's like Beatles. It's like the band. Um, it's like, you know, old school in the meaning of multiple singers, mm -hmm. which is really you don't get to see anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, these days, we're lucky if one guy can sing, you know? <laughs> so you've got three singers up there, and you get to uh, do well, some of your solo songs. Three some singers and, and three more on top three, of that. Three background and, singers, and, incredibly up. I mean, and then, you know, and, and Sven. I mean, we, well, I think we've really yet to tap in to that harmonically, what we're going to be able to do vocally, you know, with things. Yeah. Because just getting all the instrumentation... To function together you know two guitars is one thing yeah third guitar yep like why yeah. it's like oh there's a reason and there's there's a use for it you just have to think differently right right, right. skinner skinner was the king yeah, of it yeah. you never it never sounded uh cloudy or uh people stomping on each other or redundant nope not at all you're like there yeah. it is man it's yeah. a powerhouse when it's done right yeah, and so we learned how to do that this year. But we just did it in front of everybody. You know, most people go and rehearse and and work it out. But we just everybody had to learn how to do this thing, and you do it when you live together. Hell yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, man! It's uh, it's an amazing, an amazing band, and you guys are getting ready to do a record. Yeah, yeah right. In February, yeah. That's gonna be wild, right? It's gonna be, I'm um, man. I was just saying to John, it's interesting, you know, how we started this trip this year in New York and here and, and finishing in New York. It's special, you know. Yeah, right. And the excitement it hasn't changed. It's still very exciting, but the excitement is for a different reason. Like before, it was for like the excitement of of the moment. Yeah. And now it's for the excitement of like, wow, look what we got through this year and and what's coming, man. Yeah. You know, I'm so excited to hear what we do in the record because. What has shown itself already is... Oh, it's going to be cool it's, as fuck. It's endless where we can go. And with the, like you said, with the voices and with the instrumentation and with all everyone's influences, you know, there's now there's, dare I say it, there's education in the band from yeah. some people. And Rich and I get to learn some yeah, yeah. <laughs> things, you know. You know what I think is really wild, too, is when you look at... Your last solo album was incredible. Thank you. I love this record. And Rich's last solo record was really good, too. Yeah. yeah. On their own, people aren't really coming out. And I asked Rich about this on my last interview with him. It was like, it's amazing, you know, even like Keith Richards, Talk is Cheap, incredible. You know, he did some tours. They were, they were people came out, of course. But right. eventually... You know, it would dwindle down, you know. Yeah. But what's really cool is where you guys can tour Rich and you with this machine. And now people can hear the songs in a big, bigger platform. You know mm, what I mean? Like, yeah. okay, the devil's in the detail. That's a great song. What's that from? Mm. Oh, that's from Mark's solo record. Right, right. Oh, I got to get that now. Right, right, yeah. It's almost a new style of touring. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Where you're like, okay, if we combine forces, yeah. we'll fill up th small theaters and people will hear this music. Right. That's well, pretty rad. Yeah, I mean, that that's a byproduct. And that, you know, I mean, from a business from a cynical s side of it, right. I guess, you could see like, well, yeah, that was the reason for it, but it really wasn't. Right. In fact, John was just talking about it's really interesting to listen to our solo records 
and how our lives sort of paralleled when we weren't together. Yeah. You know, we both wrote a song called In You about the same time. That's crazy. And 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 how the the records developed and and uh, and some slight depression probably. Well, I mean, coming we, off something so yeah, big. Yeah, we we went through a lot of stuff and 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 we realized like they said cuz you know, what well, we just worked up shining again for the first time with the full band. Right. And it sounded fantastic and 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 they were going I just love how simple your songs are. They're just like big frames in this open space you know and it, and we we're saying yeah and riches is the other way rich goes in the middle right and he's all of this inside business with right. all these harmonics and the close chords and all he's that chewy and my stuff's quite a more like framework stuff and you decide what's in there right 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 and then i go well, wait a minute that's because we learned to play guitar together. Yeah, that's interesting. And when you take us apart, we're both doing the same thing without yeah, each but other. But you're apart right. now. Yeah, so you're doing your part that you would always do, yeah, just that, Rich isn't there. It was the role that I learned. That's crazy, because that's why there's holes and spaces. Right, yeah. Wow, I never even thought about that. Man, that's great, right? It's cool to get back together and be able to also then trade roles in a way, like, well, yeah. I got something that's kind of like in where you live, you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. And he's learning to be a side man rather than the leader. Right, 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 it's right. It's a whole different thought, way to think. Absolutely. You know? Now, I was uh, looking at your guitars. Uh, you know, I love gear. I was mm -hmm. showing you my new uh, Carson Hess fucking Esquire. Yeah, bitching. Yeah, bitchin'. really cool. Yeah. And uh, I... I really think that it's a new era of like boutique builders. Don't you believe that? Because you're using these Ashers. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. think it's an, an era. Before, I always think uh, like 20 years ago, guys made guitars other than Alembic or the guy that made Jerry's guitars like Tiger and, right. and, and right. Rosemary. There was always guys that made guitars and you'd get it and you'd be like, this thing just yeah, doesn't yeah. play. Right? Yeah. It was funny, man, because it was like, how come somebody can't build a guitar? Right. And now with Echo Park, I had him on and this Asher and mm -hmm. Carson S. There's and, a lot of them, yeah, that are great. Yeah, yeah. And, and, they're, and, and, and Billy from Rock and Roll Relics, they're building these right. guitars that are just phenomenal, right? Right. Really so, good, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Gibson and Fender for a long time just made it too easy and too cheap to buy a really decent guitar right and, and no one else could do it and to be you have to study for a long time to make it at that level yeah you yeah to compete with the prices and then you just can't yeah you know? and so i guess people it became i mean music industry in general just has become such a money fucking you know <laughs> just you know, a money pit just just, just, just it's Give us all your money. So many small timers everywhere trying to grab a bit of it. You know? Yeah. And I don't know, maybe like like the record companies got big and ate themselves with their greed. So did Fender and Gibson and, and Guitar Center. And yeah. They wanted to monopolize and take over the small guy. And now what's happening is all the small guys are rising up. That's true. You know, the stuff that was born in their backyard and in their garage. Yeah. It's like the farm to table thing for real. Yep. Even in, in the products that we make and that we use. I I play Asher guitars because they're better than most of the Fender and Gibson get, get yeah. ones that I can find. And I like them. And to be able to talk to the builder, too. I can go the and hang too. out with the guy, yeah. Yeah, to talk to him and hang out with him. And to be like, man, you know, if I could just have this guitar... But I always love Telly Shape, but I like P90 sound, but I don't want the P90 look. And right. once you're talking to the guy, they go, I think I, I think I can put something together for you like yeah. that. Look, I got that right. guitar. It's yeah. got a, a P90 sound, but it right. looks like a 52 Esquire, you know. Yeah. Your guitar is amazing. I just checked it out. Neck through the body, all yeah. one piece, gold top, cool as fuck. Plus, it's interesting, too, when you see these guys over the years, like, whoa, what is that, right, you right, know? Yeah. I'm, man, I just... I met him through Ben Harper, and he was a cool guy, and we decided to just, to, as a goof, to, well, what happened? And he goes, if you could make whatever guitar you wanted, you know, so we thought about 
Strat and a special together, but then yeah. I fell in love with his other one. And, but I still play Gibsons, I still play Fenders, because yeah, yeah. you love those things, because you know where the... See, it took me a while to learn to play Bill's guitars, because I think part of the reason with these guys that are artists, luthiers, they make them so fine that they're almost too easy to play, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I had, did have to get used to that. Once we came up with a, in, in, like a, here's my signature model, I better like it. So I just only played that for like three years. Right. And the now, Red Asher. Red one. And man, it, it's a Strat um, scale, but P90 it's a pickups. Strat, but made of mahogany and yeah. like P90s. It's in. like a Les Paul Pro, but Strat. Right. Yeah. Wow. It's dark. It can be, but it's just, it, I love it. And I can do a lot of shit with it. And, um, but I still, a Fender, you know, there's things you can't do with it. Yeah. And you know those spots that are, you, uh, you yeah. watch out. You gotta, it makes you, you become a better little, player. Well, yeah, you, you play a certain way because of the dead spots in your guitars. Yeah. Or, I still like it. You know? I still think back to those days of Southern Harmony Tour. You got that, that uh, blonde Mary Kay Strat. Yeah. You got the hat on. Yeah. You got the brown like bell bottoms. Yeah. And you're just up there just burning it up <laughs> on my morning song, man. I just like wow, the Marshall, you yeah. know. The the three Marshall stacks was was something. What a sound, right? God dang, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to look around and see where the drums were at because you can't hear them. You know? Yeah. The uh, only thing you can hear is you. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know what I mean? It's amazing for a minute, but yeah. It, oh man, yeah, it'll take some years off you. Yeah. Oh God, right? It's bitching. Yeah, I did it. Now you got a Vibrolux and a satellite amp. Yeah, so satellite out of San I've Diego. About, collectively, I, I may have sixty for fifty-five watts. Right. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. But there's way more people. Yeah. And everyone has to. That was another thing. Is that all of us when we started last year? It was just this big, giant barrage of sound. Oh, God, that had to be a nightmare, right? energy. Everybody you know I mean? just, ah! <laughs> we thought it was great. This is fun. Yeah. Now it's like, on a good night when we can hear, there's surgical moves, and we're making songs up on the spot. It's just beautiful, you know? That's right. It's one mind, you know? It's really incredible. Yeah. And on other, on other nights, it's just an absolute disaster because it's just, it's so hard to decipher the sounds yeah. and be able to hear everybody. Yeah, and the crew guys have to know the the move, the monitor guy. So it's this year has been wonderful to to learn how to do it. Now we're ready to make a record. That's great, man. It's almost like uh, fucking what's his name's uh, band. But remember back then, um, uh, Mad Dog and the oh, Englishman, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of, yeah, you know, kind of like that. Yeah. That's that's a uh, because Rich sings in such a beautiful, honest way, you know. And and I don't have a great voice, but I can get a thought across. Yeah. But I don't want to do it all the time, and I don't have it in me to do it all the time, and neither did Rich. Yeah. And I think that's why us, on our own, didn't have what it took to carry a whole show, because that's something you learn. Yeah. And we had a guy doing that. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so together, and with John, who wasn't a front man, yeah. he's, an, he's a bass player and a guitar player. He's it's wild, right? So he had to learn how to... Be a front man. Not have a guitar. Yeah, yeah. Be a front man, And then man. deal with the whole... Yeah, the whole thing. thing. That's not Chris. Right. Yeah, it's wild, man. And to, to Rich's credit, man, he, he, he gave John the grace to find himself on stage. That's great. Because he knew it would be great. He didn't care what it sounded like to get there. Yeah. What is your favorite deep, deep Black Crows track to play live? Mine uh, to see would be like title song or feathers because they're kind of old school uh, Robin Trower, yeah, yeah. dark, evil, yeah. weird right, exit. Right. Yeah. You know these deep tracks under a mountain. You know, yeah. Anything on how much for your wings? Right. Which you guys played acoustic that night? I yeah. saw it blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. But what is your favorite deep Black Crows track to play? Oh man. Uh, I, morning song has been just there's something going on that yeah well that's thing, the classic of all time and and wiser time i mean it's corny but they you know they're there's something going on with those songs that that's why people respond to them so yeah. much and it's yeah. and it's what makes it's kind of like ideally what makes this thing 
bitching yep. is how the, we function together in such an obvious way. A lot of times it's more subtle. Yeah. But that is clearly, okay, that's that thing going. And when we play those old, like, you could hear the other guys in the band, like, I get into even uh, Hotel Illness. Yeah. Just the way I go. Bump, 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 yeah. bump. Like, I see Sven and Joe go, yeah, there yeah. it is. Because they yeah, yeah. playing it without that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I always hated Wiser Time without you. Yeah, because yeah. when it comes into that first part, I'm like, nope, you're missing the slippery. Yeah, right, right, yeah. You're missing the slippery. <laughs> I, they were all great players, but it's yeah. just like no. You, you really know? fall in love with the with the part. You fall in love with the feel, Which not is, just necessarily the song, but the feel. But you also, and that tone, and just the voice of the instrument. Just like uh, we learned Wyoming to me the other day, and awesome. I had to listen to it, and and I had like a body memory listening to it, learning it, and and I realized, oh man, no wonder the fans have been split because. That voice has been in their bedroom and in their living room yeah. and in their car and in all good times and in the shitty times. In the headphones, that man. That voice has been there singing to them, you know? So they want to follow that voice. Yeah. Unfortunately, the spirit isn't with the voice anymore. Right. The spirit is living elsewhere and it's got a whole bunch of new voices. Yeah, yeah. And new, new ones sprouted. So we'll see what happens, man. This is just the another part of the story fuck yeah sven you want to jump on the mic i've always wanted to talk to you please do sure i mean yeah it's just great to talk uh i remember when you first were in the band you used to play in joan osborne right no didn't you who'd you play with uh i was in my own band for for a few years he was I know that. He was in the Crows in the beginning, right? Well, Steve Gorman was in my first band when he moved to Atlanta. And uh, so and I was living with Chris at the time. That's how, he, how Steve met Chris. And, uh, and so we, we actually got a record contract and went to Europe and did, did a record and everything. This is while, Mr. while Black Crows was still in Mr. Crows' Garden. Right. And, uh, and Steve just, you know, was just hanging out with Chris a lot and just went that route. And I just remember saying it was a huge mistake on his part. You know, why, why would you like not take the record deal and go to Europe? And, yeah. And then a year later, Shake Your Money Maker came out. And <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I see what you got going there. Well, it's funny because they weren't really much of a band at that early on. So I could see why you were going like, why are you doing that, right? Well, I... We were in like rival high school bands, so I, I knew Chris and Rich, and I, I, you know, they were talented when they were five, you know. Yeah. And uh, but, but I just didn't think that the rest of the band was together yet. Um, and it, you know, I, I think adding Johnny actually at that time was 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 a brilliant move. It was exactly what they needed at that time. Right. He was a little bit older. He was in the the, the bar scene. He was like a rocker and kind of. Yeah, he had that look. That way, you know? He had that look <laughs> that was needed at that time. Yeah, right? exactly. Because you know, they, they, we were all much more into artsy bands at that time you know rock and roll was where were we into like rem and shit like, like that because that was georgia at the time yeah you know, that was just really big at the time you know and uh but <clears throat> but rock was was there was growing with us all we just didn't know how to we didn't have any examples really in, in our generation of, of you know of what of what a rock band would even be like besides punk bands yeah you know, yeah that was the only hard music that wasn't I mean, we all love punk um put such a silly title on something but but yeah then uh george chaculius came in the picture they changed the name to black crows and the cult had just gone electric and yeah that, kind of the same thing and so you know that that kind of stuff was happening but yeah what were you doing all those years i thought you played in um joan osborne no. but what were you playing who did you play with all those years while they were out there with johnny cult uh, I was I did my first band Mirror My Hope for a few years, right. um, and then that split up, and I was just trying a couple of other projects, and you know it's just a, a tough thing. Um, You're just out there in Atlanta, out there in Atlanta writing, you know, um, you know, continuing on the, the music path and all that. But yeah, I mean, you know, and I was playing in bands, but nothing that popped through at that time. Right. And then when Johnny left, Steve was the first guy to call me and like asked me what I was doing. I was working at a pizza place. <laughs> you were working at a pizza place? <laughs> yeah, it was, wow. Yeah. Were you delivering pizza or making them? Both. Both. Oh, oh, the place. oh, my God. That's a rock bottom, right? <laughs> rock bottom, yeah. I love it. You're in Atlanta making pizzas. You get a call that you want to join the Black Crust. I was like, yeah. Which, which record was that? By your side? By your side. Right, yeah, I remember. 
It was uh, right before Buyer's Side. You know, right. Buyer's Side was like a year later, but yeah. you know, it was the, that era, yeah. So, so yeah, I joined, and I was just so appreciative. I'm still so appreciative of just the opportunity. I've seen yeah. the other side of it, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, sorry. Let me ask you this, because this is great that uh, I get to talk to you, because I, it's hard to talk to Rich or Mark, because they were, um, they were there, and then not there. When you were going through all the other guitar players, because you came in with Oddly. With Oddly, yeah. So you never really had been with Mark, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So when Mark comes back, you know, what is that, 06 or something? The oh, 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 05, beginning of 05. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the Beacon shows. or, or Hammerstein. What, Hammerstein, yeah, I was at that run. When he comes in, are you just like, oh, oh, oh I yeah. kind of get this now? Absolutely, it was, it was, it, it was like butter, you know, like he playing those parts. I would noticed that I was since those parts were missing for me. I had started to like do some bass things to, to, uh, to bring out that essence, you know, like certain certain runs that, that that Mark would do. Obviously not solos, but certain things, inflections, that oddly or whoever else wasn't doing. So then when when Mark came back in, I was like, oh wow. I don't have to do that. He's got that, you know. Right, right. Um, and it, yeah, and it's, it's the same way I feel now. Those those songs are just best with him. That's just yeah. It's, it's, I, and and it's nothing against the other guitar players I've played with. Of course, they, I said they were all great. They Luther's are. great. In, in their own Jackie way. Green's yeah. great. Uh, you know, and um, they they were all great. But it's uh, it's just something different. You know what I mean? It's just something different. It is. There's a certain looseness. Um, it's the Mark's way Rich playing. plays too, with Mark. With Mark, and they both kind of learned together in, in in the same sense. I'm sure they've probably both talked about that at this point. But right, we were mentioned. We were talking about that earlier. Just that, you know, Rich was really young, and Mark had done a couple of records, or at least one record at that point. But, but, but to find his space in the band with Rich playing, he kind of found all the outside perimeter stuff to play while rich was on the inside that's and that's kind of still the way they write when you think about it right um mark's songs are very simple but come at you from the outside he builds a frame and there's no extra there's no waste whereas rich not that there's any waste but there's so much stuff going on yeah you, yeah yeah they get to the same place but from the exact opposite point you know? yeah um Who's your guy? Because you, uh, is it John Paul Jones? Because you you play with your fingers, and uh, you know yeah. you've got you've got kind of that vibe. But who is your guy? I mean, John Paul Jones, sure. That's over the years been been the solid. But I actually started with with Paul McCartney. That's that's where I realized Paul McCartney, right? I would actually love to play bass because I started playing guitar and keyboards. That was my first thing. But but yeah, Paul McCartney made me realize I could you know just there's so much m melody to be done with bass. It's not just rhythm section, you know. Um, but then, yeah, John Paul Jones, of course, as a kid, John Entwistle, you know, yeah. just that kind of stuff. But, but then later on, you realize, you know, James Jamerson, you get into the, you know, Motown and Stax. Of course. And all that stuff and, and the simplicity of, of those guys, you know. Oh, man, take, Duck you know, Dunn. Duck Dunn. That guy's course. insane, Carl right? Carl you know, th th those cats are, it's, it's what it's about for me. And actually, this band gives me the opportunity to, to pursue those loves, you know, um, uh, you know, th th that's the greatest thing about having played with the Crows and now, you know, with Magpie, it's the same thing. There's such a wide variety of music that you have to kind of dip your toe into all these different pools of, of styles yeah. and, and approaches, which just keeps you young. I mean, I, I feel like I'm a kid and we all have the same positive energy yeah. that we did when we first joined bands, you know, except having gone around full circle. You know? Did you play the Jimmy Page run? Yeah, yeah. yeah. oh man. Yeah. So that has to be interesting to be learning those John Paul Jones stuff oh my God. and just being going like, oh my God, everything he's doing here. Well, the first, the first call I got was, well, first we played five songs in Paris. And, right. You know, and, and, you know, those five songs was easy enough. But then we, as when we decided to do it, suddenly I had two weeks to learn the entire Zeppelin catalog. <laughs> I didn't know which songs we're actually going to be doing. So oh, you got to learn them all. Learn them all. You know. Learn them all. So that it, in in two weeks. Yeah, in two <laughs> you know? weeks. So it was the most intense studying and cramming I'd ever done. Uh, what was your day life. like? You just put them on, or did you have charts? Were you listening to CDs? The whole bit. I I, I just lived and breathed it for those two weeks. It, you know, I didn't sleep much at that time either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Put a few extra hours in the day. Yeah. But yeah, it was uh, one of the most intense experiences, and then to have it to come to fruition with. You know, Jimmy Page on stage looking at me for cues to, you know, 
Yeah. It's it's one of the most intense experiences. How was that set list picked eventually? There was a set list or were they just called out? No, but we, we did set lists and we, we kind of narrowed down uh, the catalog a, as we went on what like some things yeah. worked and some things didn't work. You know? Oh, well killed on that. Uh, of course, <laughs> yeah. not a not a Zeppelin tune, but man. But that was just to, to see the, the the joy in Jimmy's face uh, as we were playing. He was just like a kid too. And yeah. it's, it's kind of the way I feel now. I guess he was maybe 55 at that time, which, you know, I'm 50 now, so I kind of see he's in the same phase of life, so we just, if you love rock and roll, you, can just, you just have to stay young at heart, even if your hair gets yeah. gray and you got wrinkles and whatever, but, you know. I fucking love rock and roll. Absolutely. Without it, I'd be gone. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be here without rock and roll. As far as uh, my whole life, what it's about. You yeah, know, I yeah, played rock all my life, now I do comedy, and this, this show I do, everything about it is rock and roll, and I yeah. just... Uh, and I never uh, got bitter from it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think if you stay positive and just it, rock and roll doesn't owe you shit. No. You know what I mean? And the joy it's given you, you owe rock and roll. Exactly. You know That's what I mean? Really the way, I you owe rock agree. and roll. You owe rock and roll. And you should be thankful on a daily basis if you had the chance to actually play it. Or if you had the chance to, to participate in dance or sing or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're part of rock and roll, you should be thankful. No. You're still living in Atlanta? I am, but I'm I'm moving. Where are you um, moving? Uh, my folks are in Florida, so I was debating moving to Florida for a while, but it looks like now I might be moving to Nashville for oh, wow. a while. Oh wow, like Rich, yeah, and stuff, Rich yeah. he's going to be there, and we got to you know we're doing a record, and so there's a lot of a lot of reasons for me to be there. Nashville's great. It is. It's a little. It's growing like Atlanta grew, like yeah. you know, after the Olympics, uh, and it's, so that's I, I'm not you know, I always loved Nashville because it was a smaller version of Atlanta, and it right. kind of still is, but it's. Yeah, it, it's booming. And, yeah, it's booming. Every and I always LA say is moving there. You know, everywhere I always say anywhere good is gonna eventually be horrible yeah. because it was good, so everybody moved there. That's it. That's <laughs> what happened to New York. It happened to L.A. You know, of course, a hundred years ago, or whatever. You know. Real quick, your base is it a is it a vintage or a reissue? It's a reissue. It's a custom shop, uh, fifty nine piece. Same one you've been playing the whole time in the band. Um, yeah, I've had this one since uh, like 06 or 07, something like that. They made it for me, and I, I, I just love it. i got a bunch of other ones, but this one just works for this band. That's fucking great. And what's your rig? I've been playing Aguilar. Um, it's a little bit big for the smaller places we're doing, but um, I have a little um, 210 monitor that I, that I put on top of the 8x10 that uh, I can keep the 8x10 lower and just kind of have my own mix yeah. for the stage. But yeah, it's uh, pretty simple. I just kind of plug in. I've got a tuner and... That's great. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> Thanks, man, for doing the show. Uh, absolutely, Thank man. you so much. Pleasure great to meet you. Meet you. I've been watching you for years and never had you on. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk right there. Go out and see Magpie Salute. Get ready for their record. They're going to be recording it in Nashville. And uh, thank you guys for all tuning in. Leave a review and subscribe on iTunes. And candles are lit.